Hey, and welcome to another episode of the Motor City Metrics Podcast, second one this week. As we are doing our 2024 season preview alongside me, Chris Brown, and our special guest this evening, she's getting the five-time jacket. If you're familiar with the SNL skit, you know, they get the, the, the jacket with the, 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 the mark. Crystal is getting her first, uh, she'll was be getting a jacket. So, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, from the South Side Stocks website, she has many titles. This is, this is your fifth podcast this week. Is that right? I mean, maybe six at this point. I know I have two left. This, hmm. Yeah, two left after tonight. I don't know. I, it's all blurry. Oh, so <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, I know this is the beginning of the year and everything. So it's it's it looks like too. You look like you have a new setup too as well. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm actually just up in Illinois because I'll be at opening okay. day tomorrow. So cool. Are you going to check out the? Are you doing anything to check out the uh, Indians opening day? The Indianapolis Indians. Yeah, opening? that's my plan. Um, I still need to look at their schedule. I've been kind of eyeing it, and there are certain dates I definitely would love to go to but yeah i'm hoping to make it to opening day there too awesome yeah that's uh for friday that's for toledo we'll be out there for that but uh let's get right into it the the white Sox have had probably one of the most to, to be polite a troubling last year mm-hmm. i mean i don't know what how else to put it but an organization that um has suffered through a lot of uh, Turmoil, just turn turnover, just a lot of really stupid things said in the media by your owner. Um, I, I'm not gonna. I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm not trying to. I mean, I'm just pointing out things the way they are. But where to begin? I mean, first and foremost, when we never really got your reaction with the Gets hire. I mean, what was your first reaction with that? Oh, I mean, so I got so excited when I heard Rakan was gone and Ken Williams was gone. And so for like that 30 seconds of joy knowing they were gone, but then the realization hit that, oh, it's just going to be Chris Getz. And he has had one of the worst farm systems for the past seven years now. Um, So immediately it was like, oh, great. So he can't do a minor league uh, job very well so great let's promote him to the major league for my team um and he i mean he's just as bad he might be a little more ballsy than Rakan ever was but he's still terrible and the off se- off season really just proved that um so i think we all knew it was coming and we just had our 30 seconds of joy before that realization hit Right. So one of, the, one of the comments in here, Joe wanted to know, did the White Sox go start going downhill with La Russa? I mean, I don't want to place the entire blame on La Russa, but it, it definitely caused a really big shift in dynamics. And, you know, fans were mad. Um, I mean, everyone was mad. And I don't think the players really fully accepted it either. And I know the clubhouse started going downhill. Things were just getting out of hand. Tony was falling asleep in the dugout. He didn't know rules anymore. When you bring someone that's been in retirement for over a decade out of retirement, you're not going to win any games. And I think he's pushed a lot of players away. I think he pushed a lot of fans away. And he was just really a disgrace. And I think he was kind of the linchpin to an already crumbling system. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Chris. Oh, nothing. Yeah, I, w- I was just saying. You know, it's still kind of stunning from from my perspective. I think on on this version of, of the podcast last year, I said uh, that I thought the White Sox still had the most talent in the AL Central and had a chance to win if if they stayed healthy. Yeah. And everything went south again, and it's it's just stunning because you know the Tigers have been rebuilding forever, right? It's it's go- going on uh, 10, 11 years now, <laughs> and we got to see from afar how the White Sox like oh they they seem like they were the 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 up and coming squad going to be the toast of the central for a while. And they had basically a year and a half and then it all fell apart again. And it's just, it's just kind of stunning. And it's, uh, I don't know. It's there are people, I know Tigers fans are like, Hey, we don't want to do this. Like the white Sox did. We want to do this right. Slow and steady. But uh, I don't know. Is, is there anything that you can point to specifically? I, I guess it would be the LaRusso maybe, but anything that, that really caused this to, to fall apart so quickly. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously the Russo is the the biggest part in that, and I love there's a comment that says somewhere in the multiverse the Sox hired Hinch, which is funny <laughs> because when they announced Tony yeah. Larusa, they actually, and this is honest to God truth, they tweeted out a picture about the Tony Larusa hire with AJ Hinch's autograph yeah. on it, and then had to very quickly snap that right off the internet. But it's real. There are screenshots that are they're still in existence. Um, so that is hilarious. Um, but no, and Tony mm -hmm. didn't help. <laughs> their pitching um, honestly just went on a downward spiral. Like I know they didn't know what to ever do with Michael Kopeck. And now Michael Kopeck is just broken. And mm -hmm. he's going to be in the bullpen. And he was supposed to be this phenomenal pitcher and he is he's got the stuff but they never knew what to do with him they misused their bullpen and they couldn't keep a starter healthy and then when you add that drama into the clubhouse it's just an implosion and it's not it's not gonna get any better and I, I still don't think it's great you know the one thing that I, I, I kind of miffed about a little bit is the fact that here they are with all this international talent. You look at Luis Robert Jr., who's still on the team, and there's just this abundance of international – the ability to at least develop international prospects. But that the, the, the question in that Crystal becomes in, it just seems like they haven't – that's the – it almost like seems like something's lost in translation there with that. Is it – I'm just wondering if how much of the – it's either development or just just – identifying talent or in, uh, badly. So what I will say, and we kind of just refer to this as the Cuban pipeline. It's always kind of been there. Jose Abreu, once he came along, it just expanded and it was wonderful. And people wanted to come to the White Sox because of Jose Abreu. You know, they saw how he was playing. They saw that it was possible. And we just developed this very, strong connection with international signings and we were able to develop them for the most part again then you know gets comes in and development is lost um but now like jose brayu is gone and it's just slowly sinking down like this could be moncada's last year i don't remember how much is left on luis roberts contract but again i don't think moncada is going to be there next year so they're just slowly 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 destroying this stuff that was built, you know, back when Mini Minoso was on the White Sox, like that's how long it's been going. And they're just, it's, they're just letting it deteriorate by just not caring anymore. Yeah. I, I yeah, recall what Alexi Ramirez was there for a while. And then even, you know, some guys didn't work out. I think it was a Diane Vicieto didn't work out so great, but if you have that pipeline, we've talked about this a ton because the Tigers have had very little success in the international market. It, sometimes it just feels like if you get that one player and Jose Abreu seemed like that player, uh, then yeah, everybody wants to come there. But uh, I guess it can go away just as rapidly. Um, and, but I'm but, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and Jose Abreu was kind of the glue to the team. Mm -hmm. He was the leader, even if he doesn't think he was the leader. He was really that the glue that kept that team together. And with him going to you know our mortal enemy, <laughs> I think it just, it really set the team up for failure. There was no real leadership anymore. I, you know, I, I was going to uh, ask about Dylan Cease because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I guess Robert is still kind of the, the, the last bit of that, you know, title team. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think there was a lot of speculation about Cease getting traded, but mm -hmm. I was curious, uh, you know, did you think it was going to happen? And, and how were you, how'd you feel about the return that they got from that? I knew it was going to happen and they gave us decent prospects, but we can't develop prospects to save our lives. So that you could give us your number one and number two prospect, and we're going to destroy them in <laughs> half a season. <laughs> well, optimism. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> nothing. There's no optimism here. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the season. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's – so, that, yes, the, the, the looking into the 2024 roster right now, there is a lot of, you know, uh, kind of really fun 
headlines, uh, the White Sox, uh, Pedro Grafal motivated for the 2024 season, which I would, one of those headlines that go, well, they should be motivated. Yeah. Um, but as far as this roster breaks down, there, I mean, predictions across the board, we're looking at possibly about 100, 100 loss season. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm looking at this team and I'm looking at guys like, I have no idea who Tanner Banks is. I mean, um, it, it, it's like this. I mean, I did like the sign of Eric uh, Fetal. Fetty. Fetty. Thank you, Eric Fetty. But beyond that, I just, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to maybe find a spin to this, but I'm looking at the infield right now. And I, I don't know. What do you, what do you consider? Okay. Let's just go, let's just go with one the nice thing forward. What is a position of strength you think on this team, Crystal? Ooh, um, honestly, I, I still feel like they can have really good at bats because you do have very powerful bats like you on Mancada. When he's healthy, he's phenomenal. You've got Luis Robert, again, always good. And then, <laughs> yes, thank you. And then, you know, when Eloy's healthy, he's good. And people think he actually might finally have a year. He still has yet to play a full year with this team because of his injuries. So again, if he stays healthy, those are really just deadly at bats. And like, shockingly enough, Paul DeJong was not a bad pickup for them. Um, mm -hmm. He's kind of proven that in spring training, his at bats have actually been pretty decent. Um, same with Dominic Fletcher. Like they've got the potential to be really good at the plate. If that plate discipline is there. I can see yeah, that. I like that. Yeah, I like Fletcher. That was that was a solid kind of under the radar mood. Yeah, because because he was uh yeah he did did some things with Arizona and, and to get him I thought was was pretty nice. And I'm looking. I didn't pay any attention to the White Sox spring training because yeah you know they're a Cactus League team right so I didn't even see them. Uh, but it looks like a lot of their starters actually performed pretty well in spring. I'm looking at Nestrini had a. I mean I think he's playing and getting on the uh, in the in the rotation right. And then yeah. Fetty had a good and Soroka, which I we talked about that. I think that's that's a fun story, and I hope that he can come back. But uh, and the Tigers, of course, are going to see Garrett Crochet, yeah. which is a fun story <laughs> in its own. I, I'm curious how you feel that's going to go. So I love Garrett Crochet, and he definitely has the potential to be incredible. But this is his first real start mm -hmm. <laughs> in the major leagues. You know, he came to us as a starter that never started. Uh, he was just in the bullpen constantly and he could throw a hundred easy. Um, you know, he's just, he's got a beautiful wind up. He's so talented, but he's also coming off Tommy John and has never started. <laughs> so it's one of those things where you just kind of hope for the best because you know, he's a talented kid and he did have a really good spring training. So, Hopefully it's the right move. You know, it was just like a little swap with Kopech and Crochet. Um, and I, I think it's the right move overall. It's just a little nerve wracking to know that he's your opening day starter, maybe your ace of the season. <laughs> yeah, there's the, 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 the most common thread um, among Tiger fans, or the, the keeps, keeps coming up about the White Sox is thin, pitching yeah. thin. But the one prospect that I, I, I wanted to ask about, and I was a big fan of him when the whole process of him starting along was Oscar Colas. Horrible mm. spring. I, I, is it? Yeah. I'm just wondering if it's something in between in between the years with him, or is it just too much for him at at this point? I think it might still be too much because again, he's he's still really underdeveloped. He can, you know, tear everything he can tear everybody up when he's down in charlotte he's phenomenal he's great and then he comes up here and again it's a really it's a different energy um oh <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry oh, oh, oh I put samuel's comment samuel in the oh. chat goes crystal you're talking to a fan base who a few years ago had matthew boy as an ace we yeah. sympathize yeah yeah. <laughs> I, yeah i feel your pain i mean we had chris sale and those were the good days Mm -hmm. oh, it's been really dark since. Um, but yeah, I think Oscar just needs a lot more time to develop because 
he's really hit or miss when he's up here, um, which is unfortunate. Like he'll have these bursts that he's just incredible. And then the next day it's like he strikes out looking every single at bat. And that's frustrating. Because the biggest thing I look at with Colas is the raw, like in terms of his ability to feel the ball, he's a good defender. Mm-hmm. We knew he pitched before in Cuba, mm-hmm. but it just seems like there's, especially the one thing about Charlotte, even with in terms of like some of the numbers I saw down there too, it just seems like the, the I guess, I don't know. It just seemed like he was it, the strikeout rate, like the strikeout, even the strikeout, like the uh, his eye. I thought he had a good eye down there too, and it just seems like now he comes up here and it's just they just know exactly how to attack him, and he just doesn't not responding correctly. Yeah, yeah. It his his case is very frustrating because I know he has it in him to be great, but he's just too easy for all the pros that have been here for a decade now. Uh, you, Purdue, uh, I, I know you it seems like you've been having some technical issues. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, my technical uh, support person just got here, which is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you, Purdue, you have a yeah, I was going to say, you, Purdue, you want to, I'm sure, I know you have a couple questions for Crystal. My question, I guess, and if you covered it, just shut me up right away, which my wife feels, feels free to do as well. Um, <laughs> we were, I, I caught a little bit about developing talent. Mm-hmm. Um what were your feelings about staying in house with Chris Getz? Yeah, um, we we did briefly cover it, and I was just so incredibly disappointed because he's failed epically down, you know, in the minors. He can't control a team there, and for him to come in and replace an already really incapable. GM was just a slap in the face to fans in all honesty like they didn't look outside anywhere it was Rick is gone we're bringing Chris up no one cares we we don't need anybody we've you know it's kind of like the whole joke about how you want McDonald's but you've got McDonald's at home like he's our McDonald's at home but it's not good, and your mom baked the oven or baked the fries in the oven, and it's just oh, yeah, it's sucky. It's just not yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of the like, I think it was the Eddie Murphy joke from uh, Raw. Oh, when he was talking about the yeah. my mom they had the peppers in him, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, this ain't no hamburger from McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I think I saw. Uh, um, I don't know if it was today or so. It was a quote from Chris Getz to, talking about how they think that they can go out there and beat anybody, and, and it's. You know, on the one hand, like of course, everybody's you're always going to say that, right? But yeah. the one, the thing I like to joke about is uh, I think it was the 2019 Tigers, which were just abject. I think uh, Ron Gardner put a like a laminated picture of the World Series trophy on the door to the clubhouse and said, "If you don't think we're winning this, then don't come in." It was like, all right, okay, I get it, but no, <laughs> knock it off. We're, yeah. we're not winning that. So, I, I is it, what's the path out of this? Do you do you is it is it so dark right now that you can't even see the dawn, or is it is there a way that you you vision white Sox, you know getting back to respectability in a year or two the path out of it and i hate to be morbid but the path out of it is jerry reinsdorf dying or selling the team and he will not be selling the team so jerry reinsdorf will be dying before it gets better i, I always say that about other things the funeral home will determine the outcome eventually yeah. for you and, yes. and, and <laughs> speaking of jerry reinsdorf the one thing about this offseason crystal that i feel that is Remember, it reminds me of my father is him at like just some of these some of the things that are out getting out leaked in the media like he the the ask he's asking for the stadium funds i mean nashville is even pointing like are you, are you high like it's just and the reason why it reminds me of my fa- my father it's just reminds me of my dad i'm not trying to be morbid when i say this but my when my dad got dementia it just sounds like an old man like ranting it's just like yeah. Dude, what are you what are you doing? And that's where it's like it's embarrassing, and because I, I know for a fact that White Sox fans are some of the most passionate, smart fans out there. They're loyal, but come the f on! <laughs> I mean, come on! I mean, when you're sitting there, it, like he embarrasses himself on a daily basis out there. Yeah. I mean, what was the most? What was one of those things that you heard while you're sitting around with the family and you're just going, look at your phone, and you're like, all right, Dad. Or excuse me, or old or person of uh, figure, like come on, 
I mean, what was what was that come on moment that you're just like you you had enough? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Chicago is broke. We charge tax like we you have to pay for your plastic bags if you go to a target if you go to a grocery store like you're paying for your plastic bags because they need that money to come back into the city mm-hmm. and yes they have this wonderful patch of land in the 78 and it would be a great place to put it but he went in thinking that they were just going to give him four billion dollars they were going to give a billionaire four mm-hmm. billion dollars That's insane. and he just jerry reminds me so much of just like the racist uncle that you have and your mom's like oh just you know there's a, from I another mean, time just don't he, think about it and you like, was in vietnam leave it alone yeah you know, I mean, that's that's who he is and he also he's got two teams in the yeah. city he's, he owns God, the yeah. bulls I really what an asshole <laughs> I recently found out that Benny the Bull makes four hundred thousand dollars a year. What the mascot? Whoa, yes, the whoa. mascot. I, I, I will what? do that for half of it. Sweet. I'll do it for half. Wait, 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 wait. Benny the Bull makes four hundred thousand dollars a year. Yes, he does. And my and my ass with my bachelor's degree and all my student loan debt because I'm not a damn fucking mascot. <laughs> Get the. F- Yes, yeah, oh, sure. that comment you just pulled up about throwing Jerry Cross under the bus. That's what Jerry does. Mm-hmm. He hey, used what and the f- are we doing here? <laughs> Hell, I I'm don't sure know. the poor bull shows up at a lot of libraries and yeah. grocery <laughs> store openings. He is everywhere. <laughs> South, Paul, Paul, South Paul was out yeah. today just giving away hot dogs. What am I doing? Oh. In front of a Chick fil A. Oh, well, that's the Chick fil A. You're going to anger them with giving away hot dogs. But that, uh, I think it's a, the most a mascot has made since the Pirates mascot in the 80s, I think. So, funny you say that. I just recorded an episode on one of my podcasts about the Pittsburgh drug trials. I saw you tweet something about a mascot in the 80s, and I was like, all right, I know what that's got to be. So, yes, I, if uh, nobody's ever looked at that, then week. yeah, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll give a shout out to that. Some people can learn that if they don't know about it. <laughs> the comment of the night from Cameron the pitch of Jason oh, and Benetti will pay you more than Benny the Bill. Bull. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, boy. Pain. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is, that is one thing we we haven't talked to you about. Uh, We've been avoiding. Uh, you know what? To be we fair, did, though, Chris, we, I've been avoiding talking about that. The Tigers <laughs> stole your stole your announcer, um, but uh, I know we, we've heard enough of national broadcasts and stuff to uh, with Benetti to know he's awesome. But uh, I don't know if you have any particular things you you like about him or want us to look for. Gosh, Jason is the best in the business. Like he is somehow the most professional person you can listen to, but also just the funniest and will just give you the most off the wall jokes. Like he, he's a big breaking bad fan and he's a big arrested development fan. Outstanding. And he'll just make like these random nineties references all the time that like, you have to really be listening to catch it. But if you are, which I always was, I was like, Oh, that was a good one, Jason. That was a good one. Um, and he's just, he's so funny. He's so kind. Uh, during the pandemic, when, you know, nobody was able to go to those games, he was on Twitter, basically, because he's got that iconic voice. Everybody knows Jason Bonetti's voice. And he was on Twitter, just taking requests from people for like shout outs to someone. Um, you just like DM him what you wanted to say, and he would record a video of him saying it. And, you know, tag that person or, you know, share it. However, like he's just Free one cameo. of the most sincere people in existence. And, you know, he's inspired my son. My son will be in high school this fall. Um, and he's wow. got, I know, wow. I know. I, just, I, met him, I had a pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago with my son. Yes. And I guess he's in high school already? Yeah. I'm wow. only like 26. So, yes, I do. <laughs> you know. I- yeah. I mean, I don't now. want to do the math, but um, but yeah, he his his high school he's going to does have like a trade school element too, which is a phenomenal. Like they have a career center, and one of them is broadcasting. Oh. And freshman year, he can take principles of broadcasting, so he's clearly going to do that, and then he's going to try to go to a great school. But it's because he's been listening to Jason Bonetti for so long that he just idolizes him. We all do. Um, so, you know, to have that talent gone and for someone who was a lifelong Sox fan who got his dream job, 
only to be told that Jerry didn't think he was funny and he hated him eating on TV. Okay. That was his reasoning. He didn't think he was funny and he hated that they would always bring in food on TV and he would eat it. Like they're bringing in things from the stadium that they want you to like new items yeah. that they want you to try. So it's some more get off my lawn kind of stuff. Exactly. Unbelievable. Chicago <laughs> sucks. So are, are you going to miss him harmonizing with Steve Stone to the nationwide jingle? I will even miss that as cringy as it was. I will. And I have a feeling, you know, I'll be, I'll be at opening day tomorrow. I have a good feeling that even though he's not going to be recognized by the White Sox because it's Jerry, I have a feeling that he will be shown a ton of love from all those fans because we all just adore him. I just don't see that the thing about Jerry Reinsdorf is, I mean, obviously he's too high above in his ivory tower to care what people think. But at the same time, I would think that you're that, well, I mean, never mind. You also threw a dead man, like Samuel mentioned earlier. Yeah. You threw Jerry Krause under the bus. Hmm. A man that literally gave, who ran both your organizations because you're too cheap to go elsewhere to get out of that. He didn't. And yeah, go ahead. Jerry was, um, J Krause was just honored very recently right. at the United Center. Fans booed his wife. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, oh my God. Booed. <laughs> his wife because Jerry Reinsdorf is such a piece of garbage that this is what he did to his legacy. And I was like, Hey, do you remember those six rings you got when he was there? Do you remember any of that? Like, do you remember why you make so much money and why you can still sell at the United center for a subpar bulls team? Yeah. You, yeah. he literally, Reinsdorf never had to raise because Michael Jordan was making so much money on endorsements. It didn't yeah. matter. I mean, I got a few names. I'd like to call him. Like just, it, it just, it, it blows my mind that like everybody who complains, I mean, you can say, well, Chris Illich or anything, but Jerry, I mean, I, I, I put Jerry, I put Jerry Reinsdorf up there with Jeffrey Loria as the two worst owners of all time ever. I mean, I, there, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's, I mean, Donald Sterling goes up. There's, there's a, there's a lot more. I could probably if I think throw I'm the A zoner in there too. Yeah, throw the oh that that guy. Oh, that guy sucks too. But <laughs> as far as just how how are you just so disconnected to the public and just go? You look the, the poor. I mean, it, his wife did not deserve that at no. all. Mm -hmm. you, um, I mean, I think you guys remember last season when we had paid to get those billboards up that said "Sell the team, Jerry." We put one super close to the ballpark mm -hmm. and another one that was kind of on his way to the ballpark. I mean, that's how frustrated we were. And he didn't care. People wear sell the team shirts constantly. They wear shirts of him with a big clown nose. <laughs> you know, like he doesn't care. He's he is rolling in his money. He does not care about the little people that pay his bills. No, no, no. Yeah, no. I, yeah, no. I don't. Go ahead. Chris. I was just saying, yeah, I mean, I feel, you know, this is division rival, but we've we've met so many cool White Sox uh, fans and podcasters and stuff that I, I really do feel for you guys. It's it's tough sledding sometimes when the, the team is terrible and there's no hope. Uh, I know we, we keep waiting for the Tigers to finally, you know, play good baseball so people start tuning in more. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what uh, – I guess the blessing is what that he is. He is what 90, 90 something. He's, he's getting up there. He's he's getting up there. But I I also feel like he sold his soul to the oh, devil yeah. so that he's going <laughs> to live forever. Let's see. He is he's eighty eight. Eighty eight. Yeah. So so is there a succession plan? Does he have relatives to take over, or will it be Sir Culkin? So he does not. So okay, his son Michael is the one running the operation for the Bulls right now. He does not want his children to take over for the White Sox when he's gone. I don't know why. I don't know what his plan is, but all I know is it's not going to be Michael Reinsdorf owning okay. both teams anymore. So, That's I mean, maybe we'll just to a better place right there. there. They also could just be in Nashville. Someone could just come in and swoop them up and move them down south. 
or move them to, I think Charlotte too. It would be a, I, I would rather I would it would rather be ironic if they end up moving to their AAA affiliate. I, I I would like that would be the perfect ending to that. Uh, just I, I don't know, I can see that happening because even you know Michael Jordan's based out of Charlotte too. So I mean, yeah, it, it would just be full circle. But um, so what is your last question before you get out of here? What is your official prediction for the White Sox this year? Do the White Sox? win 70 games do the white Sox win 60 games how bad is it going to be this year crystal because you <laughs> so, like to keep it everybody likes by the way everybody likes the fact you're keeping it real so oh, that's all you can do <laughs> <laughs> um so we actually just did a predictions thing over on south side Sox where we all kind of i mean we picked all of baseball but then we had a very quick little section of just white Sox stuff and i picked them to win 61 games all right. That and I really pretty. feel like that was a pretty honest prediction. I don't I think know. anyone in our group picked over 70 games. I was going to say, I'm going to say 59. I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking at this team. I'm just like, who's going to win? I, I don't know where it's going from. It's going to be, I think it's going to be just barely 60. I think it's going to be 59 wins. That's going to be my prediction for the White Sox. Uh, Crystal, plug away. What do you have going on? Oh, gosh. Where people can find you. Um, yeah, plug away. Yeah. So primarily I am at Southside Sox. I do, um, a bunch of manage, managing, editing. Woo. I can't talk. Um, and then contributing, obviously I do every Friday night. I do coverage. I also have two podcasts there. One is visiting dugout, which you guys are familiar with. At least two of you have been on it. Um, mm-hmm. and probably will again this year. Um, and that is just me talking to someone from another team where we, preview series and talk about all the pains of baseball. Um, and then we resurrected Soxy Chicks with my friend Bailey. Uh, nice. That just came back today. It'll be out this weekend. And then I'm on Casual Die Hard, which was previously Willett's Pin. It was just all Mets, and now we've kind of just blown <laughs> it up. Um, but I just we just started a podcast over there called uh, Dugout of History with Colleen Sullivan. And again, we talk about fun historic things our first episode was just released on monday was about merkel's boner (laughs) and the next one is pittsburgh drug tiles so we're just we have this huge list of things that we just want to talk about that people probably aren't aware of i mean she wasn't aware of the the pittsburgh stuff so yeah that one's really fun so those are the big three that you can find me on I'm looking forward to the Pittsburgh drug trials because I know that I outside of a Sports Illustrated archive uh, article I read a few years ago, I don't really know too much about it. Mm-hmm. That I know it's kind of really the baseball is trying to bury it as much as possible, correct? Yeah. From, from well, standpoint. I I was I was typing up my notes for it. I was finishing them up, and I always give them over to my husband. I'm like, hey, will you just you know make sure we're not like out of order? Make sure this right. this flows. And he's looking at it. And this is about the time he was starting to really get into baseball. It was mid-80s. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, he liked, he's always liked the Mets too. And um, obviously, um, gosh, I just forgot his name. Daryl Strawberry? No, not Daryl Strawberry. Um, they're, now he's a broadcaster. Keith Hernandez. Yes, Keith Hernandez. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know why that name escaped. He loves Keith Hernandez. And he's like reading this. And he's like, I didn't know any of these things and then he was like i loved tim Raines, and he's always sliding <laughs> that's why he was sliding because he's got coke vials in his back pocket that <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to break Your head first slide yeah and you know i was telling colleen this while we were recording she's like i have a tim Raines bobblehead where he's sliding <laughs> i was like you better go check his back pocket you don't know what's in there. Nice. Oh, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm my husband's like reading this and i'm just watching his face and he's just like oh, yeah. i didn't know that i didn't know yeah. what why did i never hear about this and i'm like oh, sorry i just ruined your childhood <laughs> I mean, you, you you look at some of those pictures back then with the, like your adult eye because when you look at some of the baseball cards, you look at their eyes, you're like, oh, like they yeah. have that, you know, like you, you, I don't know, like life experience happens. You're just like, well, either you know, like before you were just you, you, you contributed to whatever as a kid. Now all of a sudden you're an adult, you're like, all well, night he, bender. He mentioned one of the people um, that one of the guys that were involved 
was like the first baseball card he ever got. And he was like, that just ruined it. <laughs> so yeah, it should be good. So that, that should be up Monday. So if you follow me, you'll see yeah. it. I'm looking forward. I'm honestly that I'm stoked about that. Yeah. I'm stoked about That'd that. That'd be great. Merkel's yeah. boner was the 1908. It was a shortstop, right? Cubs. Yep. 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 Okay. Cubs, and, Cubs and Giants game. Yeah, that's awesome. So that is right. out if you want to hear about that. But I'm yeah, I'm I'm seriously that that's such a great idea, Crystal, and I'm looking forward to hearing more of these uh, cool stories. I mean, maybe one day, um, maybe about Eric Chow. I'm sure you know about Eric Chow, right? The former Padres pitcher. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds really familiar. Yeah, that was yeah. That, there's a really good there was a good documentary about him in the '80s. I remember that he was a the guy who gave up the P Rose home run or a hit rather was into some really weird religious things and ended up committing suicide. There's a really dark yes, that, I oh, do yeah. remember that. Yeah, there and him in the whole Donnie Moore thing too with the Angels too. But that's another <laughs> one. But uh, there's anyway, tons of things. I'm, I'm just I'm just so stoked because seriously, th- those are kind of cool stories that should be out and about in baseball and and should be brought up to light. So I'm glad you guys are doing that. Thank you again, Crystal. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Yes. Thank you guys so much. See See ya. Bye. 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 All right. So we are Cameron on stage here. Cameron. Cameron. He was hiding behind Crystal all the time. (laughs) Um, You know, I've I've never, uh, I think it was at the 1925 World Series. I don't hear this brought up much. Maybe it used to be the one that that ended with Babe Ruth getting caught stealing second base. That was... yeah, that was. I think it was the nineteen twenty five World Series. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that that would uh, be kind of uh, frowned upon these days. <laughs> you get caught stealing, but but then uh, you know I've read more about it, and apparently it was like a failed hit and run or something like that. But it's still like, yeah, geez, that you yeah, think boy. that there would be a little bit more uh, fame behind that, but whatever. He did enough to cover it up, I guess, with his other exploits. Yeah. I guess seven hundred <laughs> home runs is okay. <laughs> yeah, against uh, you know superior in superior pitching, but we'll, you know no. what are we gonna? What, yeah, anyways, that's not. Hey, those those eighty four yeah. mile hour fastballs had some life to them. <laughs> Cameron, how you feeling, man? Uh, better. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 It, I'm uh, really, really. Uh, that's. I wish that upon nobody. That is the worst. It, yeah. Food poisoning from fast food. So it's like peak food poisoning. Yeah, it is. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. yeah it's, it's insane. All right, so um, the I wanted to go into the rosters a little bit because now the the rosters are official, official, and we can go into exactly it, just kind of breaking down a little bit of I don't want to go position. I mean, we can look at some of the the, the strengths, the weaknesses of the Tigers, and that's what we'll start with. So, um, gentlemen, I'll start with the outfield. Let, let, or excuse me, let's go into what is a str- to you a strength of this team, uh, Chris. I mean, in terms of like looking at position players from like we go from the infield out, and I'll ask the audience the same thing: infield, outfield, bullpen, starting staff, weakness or excuse me, uh, strength. You mean the one you think is the strongest? Uh, yeah, I guess I would go with the outfield. I think uh, you know Riley Green. We I, we believe is is the uh, the best hitter on the team. Um, we're all, I, I'm very high on Parker Meadows. Uh, I don't know if I'm quite as high as Jerry. I don't know, but uh, I, I, I've long maintained that Parker Meadows was being underrated by just about everyone. And, and then you've got Carpenter and Canna out there. I mean, they could be a very productive outfield in, in just about every way. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the, the strength of the team is probably the starting pitching, theoretically. Uh, but but uh, position player-wise, I really like the outfield. You know. uh, Cameron, what about you? Uh, I think the starting pitching is slightly more of a strength in the outfield um, just because of the depth. Even if one guy goes down, um, got a dozen more waiting in Toledo. So, All right, Uper? Yeah, I, I, I'd lean starting pitching. Pitching as a whole, really, the whole staff. But I, I, was, I took a quick count, and it's unofficial because I did it in like 30 seconds. But it seems like at Toledo, there are 10 pitchers who have major league experience. I mean, one of them is like Brendan Hennefy, who it's not great experience, but still he was there, right? Uh, but they have a lot of pitchers in Toledo who have been in the majors. Um, so they have a lot to draw on should they run into some injuries or any, or some uh, poor performance with the guys they're starting with. Uh, so it has been a long time since we've been able to say that about a Tigers pitching staff, right? I mean, usually they're trying to scrape together that last starter. They're trying to get the last couple guys in the bullpen, somebody with a pulse. Um, but now they have guys who should be on a major league roster 
and they're starting on their major league roster and they got guys behind them in Toledo to come and fill holes. So I'm kind of excited about that. All right. Um, I'm going to have to say, I think a big, big position of strength is I would have to agree with the outfield and, and the starting pitching in terms of just, you look at what the potential of Parker Meadows is going to be. If Riley green mentioned that to you, but I, I, I think one of the things that I'm interested to seeing outside of that is Justin Herman Malloy at some point, if he gets a call up, uh, if he can play the outfield well in Toledo, if he earns a, getting a, a call up, I'm, I'd be interested to see his journey to the ba- to the majors and see how effective he can be. Again, you have to look at, I think the one thing that if he ends up getting the call up, can he make that transition to making sure he lays off those p- pitches and, and kind of has an effective at bats? I mean, he, he know he can walk, but I just see him struggling against advanced stuff, but hopefully he can make that adjustment. But as Joe said here too, in, in the chat, Green has to avoid a freak injury. That's, I hate to say it, but that's, if, they, yeah. if the Tigers can avoid that, then I think they have a chance to win the division. If, if Green can stay more than, than 130 games like we did our over-unders for it, I think they, they can win the, they can win the division that way. I mean, he was awfully good in between injuries last year. <laughs> like, yeah, he was. you know, he really had an awesome stretch. I, it was, he, he kind of struggled, I think, out of the gate, right? He was hitting a lot of those ground balls to second base. That's how you know he doesn't ha- quite have it. Uh, but then when he stops doing that and starts hitting the line drives and, the, and you're, you're in for some fun, I do. Um, I, I mean, none of us mentioned the bullpen. I think the bullpen's pretty strong, too. I do think that there's a little bit of a question mark with the closer just because we've seen Alex Lang so up and down. But the depth of the bullpen, I think, is really strong. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think the infield is just kind of weak. Um, and a lot of that is is falls on Javi Baez, honestly, and then the fact that there isn't really a set third baseman. Uh, but you're asking a lot from Colt Keith, who we like, obviously, but, you know, you don't want to count on him to carry the team or anything like that. And then Torkelson... Hit 30 home runs last year. I think we're all hoping that he's going to top that. But, you know, he did go out and have a terrible spring again. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, I just don't know if he's ever going to be that guy who's going to hit you uh, for a decent average. So he might just be that CJ Crone type, right, who's going to hit you 230 with 30 bombs, and that's fine. But it's just not necessarily that keystone to the offense that they everybody wants. Yeah, I saw I saw some people comparing Torkelson to Matt Olson on Twitter last week, and I I just don't see it. I, in my opinion, we hope that Torque's like peak season is what Matt Olson's average season is, which is I think he has like a one thirty WRC mm-hmm. plus for his career. So like, yeah. I I think that's going to be peak Torkelson, and hopefully we get that within the next two or three years. Yeah, I mean, I, I would rather. Right now, at this point, I just would like for one of those guys, Spencer Torkelson, to take another step forward and just show progress. If they show progress between Torkelson and Green, uh, but I did like, I hate to say what old, I mean, old BK is right, though. It's not free injury when you have one every season. True. I mean, you have to, you have to play a little differently, but I, I, he's not wrong either. Yeah. Last year for me was, I've said it many times. I wanted to see Torkelson and Green become ball players, right? That was the, what the whole season was. They really didn't have any path toward contention. So it was what kind of ball players do they become? We saw Torkelson hit the 30 homers, look more like a, at least a competent first baseman. So that was nice. Uh, Green looked good between the injuries, as Chris just said. Uh, so this year, to me, I think they I, it takes on a different hue because I honestly think they can contend for the division unlike last year. So it's not so much just watching individuals. It's about watching the whole organization come together uh, and put a winning team on the field. The individuals, though, that I want to pay attention to most this year are Casey Mize, who I think is really critical. He comes back and uh, is a productive pitcher. Parker Meadows. And then, unfortunately, Green again, getting to 135, 140 games. Uh, If those three players are impactful – uh, this year, that takes this roster to another level uh, because they, you know, weren't around for most of last season. Yeah, I mean that's where I, I I give pause on. I still think that I'm still gonna put hang on my hat on the fact that I think the Tigers still need to get another bat. If now if it comes mm-hmm. within from eternally, 
then that's great. But I think you're absolutely right. This team has to have a certain amount of health going for that to happen. And I, that's what I'm like. But then, because if you look at the farm system and go, okay, well, who's going to be the impact bat that can come up if an injury happens? I'm not. Am I, am I confident Justin Hammer and Moy will be something? Sure. But again, there's the, the, the lack of a track record of the bats coming up and making an impact right away. That is still the jury's still out on that. So here's a question I have for you guys. Tell me what you think. Jace Young makes the AAA roster, right? Mm-hmm. I was a little bit surprised by that, to be honest with you. But hey, there I'm, he is. I, nah, I'm not wasn't surprised on that, but go ahead. Uh, but uh, yeah. will they be as patient with him if he gets off to a hot start? Will they be as patient with him as they were with Malloy last year, where they basically kind of brushed off his hot start and he stayed where he was? Is Young in a, a Toledo guy for all season, or if he gets hot and this team is in it, is he in Detroit? You know, I mean, it, it really, I think a lot of that depends on if anybody else at third base has shown anything. If, mm-hmm. if Urshela, Vierling, Abanez, McKinstry, if any of those guys look like they're having a good season, um, I think that they may just stick there. But yeah, if, if Young's tearing it up in Toledo and those guys are all kind of average or struggling, then then it, it wouldn't shock me if they bring him up. I, I think this is a faster ascent than we've seen with some other guys. It's still, you know, it's not like lightning speed, right? Uh, he basically, you know, half a season at, at uh, high A, half a season at double A, and and uh, maybe half a season at Toledo, and then off to the bigs. I think that that makes sense for a player like him. Yeah, I mean, I there's a lot of the, like the over under fair, uh, on the over unders. There's a lot of people think that Young will see most time at third base too. We'll talk about the scoreboard in a second because it's the second largest, only to I believe the Mets. Uh, there was a chance to go to in, to go down to do the taste fest. Usually we do that, but I've been so slammed. Like, being sick last week put me behind, but we'll get to that. But uh, Cameron, you want to queue up what we have here from the, we got some audio from Chris Castanelli who got the chance to talk to AJ Hinch in regards to uh, there's a few things he, he got to talk to him about. One of the clips was um, the, the, the first one, how you because we we're talking about the bullpen. And how the 9, 10, 11 guys in Toledo will be used a lot in the bullpen this year. Kind of like after going out and getting Shelby Miller and, and, and Chafin, uh, did you kind of identify that as potentially being a strength of this team coming into the year? Yeah, so I, I think this, there, I think there's eight, you know, we're starting the season with eight. I think pitchers 9, 10, 11, and 12 that are in, in that are going to be in Toledo yeah. are going are gonna to impact us. And so I think what we have is we have versatility. We have guys that can go multiple one ups, two ups, even three times, um, you know, three innings. That's a huge advantage whenever somebody runs a pitch count high, or you have some guys coming, you know, like Casey's coming off an injury, or you have, um, you know, Maeda who uses a lot of pitch equity in his games and ends up coming out in the fifth or sixth inning most of the time. Um, there's other days where I'm going to be able to give him rest because guys go seven, eight, maybe even nine innings. So the fact that we're versatile in the pen and we throw strikes, we have a pretty good balance left and right, that I have a, I have a path to, to different style games. Um, there's a reason last year we were, we were great in bullpen games. And I know yeah. that's not traditionally mm-hmm. something that people like, um, but it's pretty effective. And so when you can mix and match against the opponent and, and they see somebody different, that's pretty good. So when I, when I look at our pen, I see that I that I whatever we determine that we need against this particular part of the lineup, I feel like we have it, and I feel like we have a plan B, and that's a good feeling. Um, it's not going to go perfect. Like there's nothing worse than you have a plan, you target a guy, you walk out there, you put the ball in his hand, and then he rifles a base hit or he hits a homer. Yeah. Like the feeling that you feel as a fan is the same thing that we feel in the dugout, but it wasn't done. Um, you know, haphazardly. It was done with a with a clear reason why we were trying to do it. It's just the competition that beat us. And it and if you if you get the buy in from the player, which we do, and you get the work done to sharpen whatever weapons those guys have, that's where the pitching department comes in. You can have a dynamic pen and a very unpredictable one for the other manager to have to deal with. 
if there's one thing too that he said during spring training that I liked about what you brought about Sheldon, Sheldon Miller, for example, was the fact that they, they needed to get more strikeouts last year. The bullpen wasn't towards the middle, towards the bottom among strikeouts per nine. And so when he talked about Wilmer Flores using him as a kind of a three inning uh, possibility, it makes a lot of sense because Flores has that starter ability and it gives him a kind of a different look. It, so they should they decide to call him up. And I, I think with Flores, one, the one thing is about him is I think what, what potential may expose him is if he can't, I've noticed this with his command on a slider, it's either really good or it, it's like he, it, it just, it just, kind of cur- it just floats in there and it gets hammered. I mean, what Chris, I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, it, it looked, um, look this, the spring, at least the beginning of the spring, like he just didn't have the breaking balls dialed in yet. Like a lot of them were kind of casting away from his hand and floating toward the right-handed hitters and stuff like that. And, uh, but, and, and that happened, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, spring breakout game where you saw he, he was trying to punch out the final batter and let one breaking ball go and got near his head. But then he threw a couple nasty ones in the dirt. Like, I, I uh, that may be an issue for Flores going forward, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I think he's certainly an option to pitch late innings at some point this year, just because of the the arm and the ability there. Um, and it was interesting hearing uh, AJ talk uh, in that clip with Chris, which uh, again, great get for Chris. Yes, uh, to have a whole hour of AJ Hinch is amazing. Um, we something we learned last year is how how they view bullpen usage, they talk about ups, right? Ups and downs. Uh, and, and people have heard this before, you know, they, they got to get their pitchers, their ups, but they they take it really seriously throughout the system. And they'll say that like, okay, uh, so-and-so is, has two ups today. He can get, he can do two up to two innings, but they also count if you get a guy up early to warm up and then he doesn't come into the game, that yeah. counts as one to them. So uh, just interesting stuff that they do in the organization that uh, it's, it's, it's fun to hear that from the top down. So, what a, what one of the fun things I took away from that little conversation was uh can you imagine Jim Leland or Sparky Anderson using the phrase pitch equity? <laughs> no, or <laughs> optionality <don't>... <laughs> or no. <laughs> Which I, and I I love Hinch. That was great. It was a great answer. It makes a lot of sense, but I was just trying to uh, picture Leland taking a drag and talking about pitch equity. <laughs> I just gotta get out. We got a bunch of guys you can also sounds like he only expects Maeda to get two times through the order and he expects to have to bring someone else in. Um, yeah. It's it's just weird to hear managers talk like that. And I like how he acknowledged the bullpen days. Um, yeah. They won a lot like, of them. Yeah. They were they were well over 500 in bullpen days, and it doesn't make sense because, like, Joey Wentz was, like <laughs> an op- was used as a follower in a lot of those. But, well, I mean, they won. It, it, that's a there's a, a good point now where um, I, I saw a lot of people complaining about Joey Wentz making the roster, um, uh, and and it's just one of those things where it, and like the the complaints are either that he's terrible and he sucks or or you know along the lines of he doesn't do much for me, which is I totally understand. I, he, there's better guys in the 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 league over here in Utica that are better than Joey Wentz. Yeah, Shut yeah. Well, it's you know it, it is one of those things and we've talked about this before, and it's it's sometimes it's a weird thing that baseball teams do is is that they. They, I think they think that there's more in the tank there with Joey Wentz, and they don't want to lose him, and he doesn't have any more options. And sometimes teams, I, I think you could probably argue that there are a, a pitcher or two in Toledo that probably may work out better, or at least early in the season, than Joey Wentz. But he gives them another hard-throwing lefty option who can go multiple innings. And I, like I said, I think that they think there's more in there, and they're not at this point where like they, you know, they want to win every single game, right? But there are going to be some games as there are in every season where it's just like, ah, we just need somebody to go out there and need some innings. And he's a guy who can do that. But here's, here's the thing. And the, the thing about Wentz is you exactly just said it, Chris, he's a hard throwing lefty. That doesn't, that it's something that doesn't grow on trees. So if you can find a lefty, I mean, look at a guy, for example, like Andrew Vasquez, who was a lefty, but offers it from a completely different angle. You have a guy like Wentz who can throw if, 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 the biggest pitch for him that struggles is the cutter. And when he can't throw the cutter, he can't locate that, it just makes him very vulnerable. That being said, there's still enough to work with there. And I mean, that's why, like Tyler Alexander, 
has a job in Tampa. I mean, that's just, that's what it is. Yep. And Alex Samuel's question here, you think Alex Lang will remains the main option in the ninth? I, I see he, he says, hesitates to say closer because right. Does he get replaced? I think what's going to happen is I think he, he has the option of going to somebody like Shelby Miller. I mean, I think Miller has a good wipeout closer stuff. I think it's Alex Fiedo, which um, Troy wants to know if he's still a starter. I think Fiedo can do both. And yeah. so there's, there's a possibility. I, I think Fiedo, what's going to be nice about him is he has that stuff there where he could be either a, a good long, like a lo- uh, long reliever or a guy that can come in in the eighth and ninth and really get things done. I just wonder if, um, you know, as when they get to like the sixth and seventh inning, if they kind of chart out where the where things are going to be in the ninth, if they have two lefties coming up, I mean, is it Chafin or Holton versus um, versus uh, Lang? You know that kind of thing. Because um, I could see that happening. Maybe Chafin getting a couple of those opportunities if the lineup looks favorable to him. Yeah, you know, it's, it's something we actually discussed this in, in the, the Discord a little bit about. You know, AJ Hinch is, is pretty good about not sticking guys in traditional roles like he will he will use Jason Foley in the sixth inning or fifth inning if he feels like he really needs a ground, ground ball double play or something like that mm-hmm. but at the same time I think he does prefer to have those established roles because I think the players prefer that I think that Alex Lang likes to know that he's the ninth inning guy and Foley likes to know he's like the eighth inning guy and um and I, I do think that that Lang will get the plurality of the save opportunities this year we saw last year he was really good for a couple months and then had uh, a really rough it was six weeks or so at least uh, and it eventually got back at, to, into closing games by the end of the year and ended up you know i think 20 something saves um and i i think he'll probably stick in that role uh barring injury just because as roger's saying you know there aren't there's there's not that one like huge 15 strikeout per nine arm in this bullpen that, that screams closer right now. There are a bunch of really good pieces and I could see five or six di- different guys getting saves this year, but I still think it'll be laying uh, for the majority of the time. Yeah, they don't really, I mean, I could see, we could see Jason Foley at some point too, but he would offer a completely different look too. that. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, we'll get to, there's somebody who was mentioning the, uh, Wyatt Langford stuff. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that shortly. So uh, that being said, uh, we're going to be doing. What, what was the other? I lost my train of thought on this. I feel like we're going in a direction now. All of a sudden, I'm, well, we, we did. We had our predictions, and I don't know if the, we were going to talk about those yes. at all. Yes, I have. I'm actually pulling those up right now. So those will be up here in just a quick second. Um, but no, as far as like just. Oh, the weakness. It serves like a weaknesses. I know we we talked about strength a little bit. What does concern me about the weakness factor about this team is really it's I think it's the infield, and I say that because here's why: if Cole Keith, let's say Cole Keith gets off to a bad start offensively, you have Javi Baez already struggling, and any buying as you know, like there's there was games last year where he would, would be very, very productive and then he just win these lulls. The infield to me is a weakness. And that's where I, I think that, that is a concern where at some point if Torkelson isn't hitting for providing for power, I mean, do you need the infield to be a bunch of boppers? No, but you'd want who's a hitter among that. I mean, Cole is it Cole Keith the best hitter? I mean, in terms of hitting, not just power, but hitter in the infield. I think probably yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I would, Veerling would argue it. puts the ball yeah. in the air more. Yeah, yeah I mean Veerling, Veerling uh, hits for solid average, right? But yeah, but there's not a whole lot of impact there, at least not yet. Yeah, it's just it's weird to think that, isn't it? I mean, I'm not crazy for thinking that, right? It's just on top of that, it could be pretty bad fielding infield. I mean, Torkelson's good at scooping, not good at fielding. Keith <laughs> has his struggles. Baez can be elite to bad and then third base is a platoon of guys who don't really play third base so yeah i mean that that, that scares it that scares me i mean that's a really legitimate mm-hmm. concern that you have a real kind of rough and t- i don't want to say rough and tumble i hate saying that word but a really rough makeup for an infield i mean it's just it doesn't 
bode well defensively, even depth wise too. Because I mean, like you look at so okay, are you going to then go to the light hitting Zach McKinstry to solve your issues? Uh, I don't know that that to me might be a long term. That's why I get pause about the people getting to talk about the divisions, if you will, but the infield does legitimately scare me. So we'll start with staff predictions. Uh, Chris and Cameron, uh, Chris, give us. Uh, oh, let me see if I can give a better view than this. I, I, no, never mind. I can't do that. I didn't do it that way. All right. Well, anyway, staff predictions, Chris. Uh, Eighty-four and seventy-eight, and so we did this by just like the teams that will go in the postseason. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, I'm pretty bad at this because I almost always just pick the teams that made the playoffs last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Baltimore looks pretty damn good to me. I think Minnesota is just, the, you know, they had a bunch of injuries, and I could see the Tigers winning the division or even Cleveland somehow. Uh, but I think Minnesota has just a little bit too much offense compared to the rest of the division. Uh, Texas, I think, is really good. Uh, yeah, they did win the World Series, and they're adding Wyatt Langford. Um, and, you know, the Astros are always good. I, I think Seattle has really good pitching, right? Uh, and, and Julio is, is awesome. And I like Toronto to edge out the Yankees. I think they're pretty close. I just I don't trust the Yankees to ever stay healthy. You know, when you got Stanton and you got Judge, they're just too big for their own good. Um, so and and without Cole for who knows how long, I think a month, maybe six weeks, maybe two months. Um, so that's why I went with there. And uh, yeah, I mean you could see the rest of it out there. I've got the Braves and the Cubs and the Dodgers and the Phillies and the Diamondbacks and the Padres. I guess maybe slight surprise. And I went with Juan Soto and Mookie Betts for the MVP. All right. Cameron? Yeah. So actually, it looks like you copy copy and pasted Ronk here. Um, my standings are mostly the same. I have Toronto, or I have the Yankees instead of Toronto. Oh, um, crap. which is a yeah, little different from Chris. Yeah. My and bad. then we both have Juan Soto as MVP for the American League, but I think uh, Corbin Carroll will win MVP in the National League. Um, and then, yeah, I guess my hot take picks are uh, I have School Bowl winning American League Cy Young, and I have Parker Meadows winning Rookie of the Year in the American League. Um, my did thought process the... there. I'm sorry, I was asked, did you have the Tigers win in the division or no? Uh, no, I think uh, I think the Twins will um, gotcha. win the division. Um, but, yeah, I think Parker Meadows will beat Wyatt Langford Rookie of the Year just based off stolen bases and fielding. I think he'll, the war. he'll be yeah. able to accumulate uh, one or one and a half more war than Wyatt Langford. And then I'm hoping for a 2020 season. So that'd be awesome. That. Oh man, that's, that'd be, that'd be sweet to have a kind of a 20 mm-hmm. season, something like that. Um, so yeah, cause I don't want to have the, the same copy and paste errors, but I will just instead just do the way I should have done in the first place when I did these stat predictions and just shared the screen or shared a little differently, but um, so I went a little bit of a different route with uh, as far as like picking my MVP, by the way, for American league is going to be who I think did we go with who picked, who picked Julio? Anybody pick Julio Rodriguez, by the way? I didn't know. I had, no. I had Soto and, and uh, okay. Yeah. So I thought Julio Rodriguez, I, I don't know. I, I think if he, if he can, go ahead and, and have a good monster season and put the Mariners on his back. I think it will be phenomenal. I think it'd be a great story. I have Mookie Betts in the, in the, in the NL. I mean, that's just a given. I mean, if he produces like he did last year and he's playing shortstop, come on now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, I did pick St. Louis because the Cardinals are just sneaky as hell and they find ways to do it. And I, I'm a big fan of Mason Wynn. So I, I'm a big fan of the, the the Cardinals will come out and with their rebuilt pitching staff. I think the Cubs, Arizona has a setback. I think they get into the wild card a little bit. Um, I think they make a play for the wild card. I couldn't pick Tigers in good conscience to win the division as much as I. It's just again I'm, the offense kind of scares me. I did pick Tarek Skubal to win the American League Cy Young because I just want that to happen really bad. And this. Does not pain me whatsoever. White Lamford for rookie of the year. Jackson Churro yeah, in in DNL. I mean, I think Lamford Langford. I was going to think of like a pitcher that's going to come out of nowhere, but I just really didn't see that happening. And then Uper, you have you're the you're the outliner. You're the one that has the Tigers winning the division. You want to go ahead and uh, uh, yeah. You have, Cole Ke- you have also have Cole Keith winning the rookie of the year, and I I I like that a lot. 
And if he does, that's the big reason why they win the division. <laughs> so, um, you know, here's the thing. I, I just have spent so many of the last few years expecting the worst. And I've always been typically on the low end of our spectrum of wins predictions. Um, sometimes crazily so. But again, I just look at this season as a possibility. And there's no guarantee. When you make predictions, I mean, it's all it, it's all in fun. But they have enough positives potential positives that i think it can outweigh the players on the bottom end of the roster that tank the whole thing right and i think the pitching depth is enough that their run prevention should be pretty decent especially in their division which is still not full of offensive powerhouses um i think their run prevention will be good enough that if their run production only gets up into say the low twenties or the high teens, and it's not a massive improvement, just a small improvement. I think they can win eighty-seven games, and nobody else in that division worries me too much about going past eighty-seven games. I mean, some, I mean, the Twins might, but I wouldn't count on that. All right, I mean, uh, I understand where the logic is. I mean, I just, mm-hmm. I'm, st- I'm still concerned about the again the offense is where I, I get positive. But yeah, you know what, Uber? I mean, I'm glad that you're. Uh, coming around being optimistic i'm the optimist uh, yeah. yeah you know i uh, also for like for the um rookie of the year put cold keys I, was, I went yeah total opposite with uh uh shota shota imanaga for the for, for the cubs uh older player but certainly someone who i think if the cubs are going to contend and i think they can because i think the cubs boy when you, you look at their roster overall there's nobody that knocks your socks off, but there's nobody that sucks either. You know, I, I think they're, I think they have enough to, uh, to hang in and win that division. Cause I don't think the NL central is that great. Um, MVP. I went with uh, Acuna in the national league. Uh, I know, but Betts is probably the favorite, but I'm a big Ron, Ronald Acuna guy. And uh, in the American league, I took Corey Seager. I think they're going to play a lot of big games there. Uh, he seems to have a, a knack for rising to the occasion. So we'll see if he puts up some good numbers, and I think he could get an MVP award. All right. He was my pick last year. I, I, I will say this about you know Langford stuff. Um, I know it's just going to be an issue forever because he's been so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's it's just hard in baseball. You just you just don't know because you, you it's almost apples to oranges. You've got a high schooler and a college player, and it, they're three years apart in age. It's a, it's light years in professional baseball development. Uh, I, you know, I could go back to 2006 when the Tigers had a kid they wanted to draft, a high school kid they wanted to take in the draft, but the college pitcher fell to them, the best pitcher in the draft. So instead of taking Clayton Kershaw, they took Andrew Miller. Now, uh, you know, they ended up using him to trade for Cabrera. It would have been Kershaw traded for Cabrera anyway, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in the end, and Miller made the majors almost immediately because he was the best player. And it was like, oh, this is going to be a stud. And it just didn't work out that way. You know, we have to wait to see. And sometimes you can't tell for a decade or more. Um, I, You know, I think it was 2009. Was that the Steven Strasburg draft? I think yes, that was it. And Strasburg, you know, the best best college pitching prospect ever, right? Comes up, has the best prospect debut ever. Uh, 10, 15 picks later, I believe it was the Giants took, uh, took a, a high school kid named Zach Wheeler. And then, you know, they traded him to the Mets for, I think, Carlos Beltran, and he's bumped, bounced around, been hurt and stuff like that. But 15 years later, Strasburg's done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Zach Wheeler looks like one of the best pitchers in baseball and, 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 and you know, could be for the next decade. It's you just, you, you can't tell right now. It's way too early to know who made the right pick here. And, you know, Mike also, Trout was, like, no, go ahead. Yeah. Mike Trout was drafted 25th that year. So, like, yeah. The there's Tigers took some Jacob guy. Player. Yeah, there's some guy way down the list for 2020, 2023. That's uh, probably be better than Langford and Clark. Yeah. yeah. You know, you look at not to, just because it happened to one guy doesn't mean it's going to happen to the next guy. Uh, but, you know, for everybody who's excited about Langford, he should be. He's he's obviously killing it right now. And we, we loved him coming out of the draft. Uh, that's great. But boy, you know, you know who else looked good in spring training? It was Jared Kellenick. You know, I mean, there's a guy who was killing the ball. You think, oh, there's a star. And all of a sudden he faces the real bullets of major league pitching when the regular season and things are different. You know, and I'm not saying that happens to Langford, but 
facts are tomorrow is his first real game. Everything that's happened so far has been kind of funsies. Okay, this is the real thing starting tomorrow. So we'll see what he what he brings to the table. And and there's also the opportunity, the possibility that uh, they're all really good. <laughs> Yeah, like that that happened. That like you know, there was the year Bryce Harper and Manny Machado both went in the top three, and that worked out. And then what was it, two thousand five, where everybody was good except for poor uh, the the catcher that the the, the Mariners drafted. But it was that it was like Ryan Zimmerman and Ryan Braun, and it, even people like Ricky Romero even had a couple good run before he disappeared. It was it was a credible draft. So yeah, it, it's just too early to tell anything. All the comments in here tonight are uh, on point. Um, so one of the things that did come out today was the new scoreboard over at Comerica, which is now, like I mentioned it earlier, the second largest mm-hmm. only to the Mets. And it is a, it, it might look familiar for people who play video games. And I will see what I mean by this it is the giant T from Tetris. I mean, if you, if you really think <laughs> about it, it is like the kind of Tetris like shape to that. It's so, a big one. Well, wow. in, in it, and not just the scoreboard. They they uh they updated all the TVs that were around the park. They yeah. used, they were still like 2003 era tube TVs. Now they're flat screens, and hopefully they'll be working and you'll be able to hear the radio and stuff. They're they're making improvements to the ballpark experience, which is good. I'm Here's sure. Here's a question I have: as, Pass down the ticket prices. As someone, I'm going to be the first to admit this. As a Tiger fan, my lifelong, I went to one game at Tiger Stadium. I have never been to Comerica Park. Um, <laughs> I've seen the Tigers all over the country, except in Detroit, really. Um, that massive scoreboard, what's that going to do to the, how the, how the, how the ball, how the field plays? I mean, is that enough to affect the wind? I don't think so. I mean, if you, if you think about the, the size of it and in terms of just like, it's not, I mean, as far as it's sticking to one area, I mean, it's not, it's not protruding out, if you will, or anything like that. Um, and yeah, and I've never known Comerica to be terribly affected. I'm like, you know, it's a baseball stadium; it gets affected by wind. But it's 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 kind of sunken down for yeah, one uh, thing. So there's a little bit. There's a lot of wind. There's time where you get a lot of wind on the concourse when you walk in. Uh, and I'm sure you know, get the ball, baseball up in the air, it, it gets affected. But um, I don't know. I mean, it, you never know. Honestly, you know, any uh, cosmetic changes to a ballpark can have ad- adverse side effects, but. I don't know. It has the two areas for air underneath. I don't know if that's going to create some sort of vortex. Yeah, exactly. Get, uh, I just wonder it's going to play because it's so big. I we'll mean, have to get Doctor Hart right... Smith back on the air and, and talk to him. <laughs> you know, if it was just a run of the mill scoreboard, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But now they're you know, they're touting how big it is. I just wonder if that's going to block any wind. But the biggest not. the biggest scoreboard is always like the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. It's just it's like oh, it's just our turn. It'll be it'll be Tampa next year. I'm like oh, look at this. <laughs> so I know enjoy it, I guess, but uh, it, it'll it'll look a lot better with a bunch of crooked numbers on it for the Tigers. Yeah, I mean it, it is going to be pretty cool. I'm just I'm, I'm seeing how the Tigers can. They're they're starting like look. If I will say this, if there's one thing about the Tigers in the last year or two, I'm trying to get a little bit of a sense of humor, a little bit, and they're kind of maybe more being more self aware of things. Mm-hmm. They know they have to improve their in game experience. They know they have to do these things because people notice it i mean even on social media too and so i i as much as like for example tomorrow i'm doing a presentation for al central review for saber for the saber cut for our saber chapter i was talking to gary gillette who's our saber chapter president and he's like he was asking me he goes you know roger just make sure that you know we're gonna we're gonna keep it real you know if you will and you know, I'm going to talk about the farm system and all that and just how it, it's made some steps, but you know, it, they're just, it's the Tigers are watchable as daily Ninja B daily Ninja B has just said, he is absolutely correct. I all, all we're looking for in the stretch to tomorrow is I'll close with this. Really? I think for the first time in uh, probably probably a decade plus that I'm actually not having a sense that I'm going to crap my pants watching this team. <laughs> like, I'm just not going to, it's the other shoes not going to fall. I mean, I think there's going to be times where it struggles, but it's going to be an entertaining product. That is what all I can ask for. Mm-hmm. If the Tigers win 
you know, I, I think I put 80, I put them at 85 wins. They went 85 wins for the first winning season since 2016. That's, that's all I can ask for. If it can be a topic of conversation, the Tigers have, again, they hired a guy by the name, they hired Jason Benetti. They've done some things where you have to go and go, crap. It, it's not, I mean, you, we were talking about the White Sox earlier. All their offseason headlines were absolute trash. I mean, the White Sox <laughs> got smoked. The Royals, to a certain extent, too. I mean, the Royals, you know, I, I can't say the Royals had like the worst offseason than the White Sox, but the Twins didn't do much. Cleveland didn't do much. And then you look at some of the headlines across Detroit did for all the bitching that the tr- people talk about the bats, the lack of free agents, you know, like here, like th- and, and you, here we are. I don't have to work. Like we're not talking about Nico Goodrum making the roster, which he, by the way, congratulations to him. He's on the 40 man roster for the Rays. Mm-hmm. We're not sitting here. I don't have to stretch to talk about things. There's plenty to talk about. And I've been doing this for so long. We, uh, sorry. I hate, I hate saying I, I think we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I know Cameron's relatively new, but the person <laughs> company, I mean, the, the point is if Cameron is coming out of his shell to talk about baseball, then you know that you're saying something to a fan who has been watching this product for so long that he doesn't remember the last time they were good. Is that fair to say Cameron is an adult as in, is it a, a as an adult? adult so yeah. my Twitter bio, since I started my Twitter in, 2021 my twitter bio is tigers fan who is trying to feel the high they had during the jim leland era Mm -hmm. right Right. that was middle school that was middle school basically Mm -hmm. late elementary school middle school i just want that feeling back that feeling of being up 11 o'clock at night watching them clinch the alds phil coke throw his glove on the ground like amazing feeling i just want to feel that again but as an adult is that too much to ask for no (laughs) no no it's never yeah, yeah, and 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 it'll be. It's been long enough now that once they do it again, it, I don't know if it'll be quite like 2006 was, but uh, it'll be a celebration again because it's been, it's been rough, and and then you get complacent, right? You just expect the Tigers to be good every year, and uh, they were there for a while, and and then it just ends. I thought 2016, I thought they had a chance, and I guess they, they technically they did, and then and then it just collapsed, and uh, boy, I guess we could just. <laughs> I'm just hoping for the high again before we yeah. have to think about the fall in the future. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done a podcast where the Tigers have been over 500. I mean, like as a, a complete think, season. Yeah, as no, complete I think. Se- go ahead. I think we we were what we were talking about not that long ago was uh, who was it? Who was it that uh, was a free agent? The pitcher. Um. Yeah, yeah, he was the kid who hit Jonathan Scope. Like it was first thing he did. He broke or oh, uh, Jacoby uh, Jones. Um. <laughs> I don't know. We, we were we were discussing the the weird 2020 season and how the Tigers had played the Brewers and the guy they brought in a guy to make his major league debut and he hit two people immediately, including he broke Jacoby Jones' hand. Um, oh, and the yeah. Tiger, Tigers Tigers won that game like 12 to one and were like 17 to 16 on September 1st, 2020, and then they went like six and 20. Uh, <laughs> and that's I think that's probably the last time they've been above 500. Uh, you know, yeah. certainly in 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 September. Bickford, but, thank you, thank you, uh, Michael, Phil Bickford. Yep, Michael. Again, Michael. Michael Mayer is the resident genius in our YouTube chat. I, I, I kid you not. I feel like if if there's a closer, if we had a save all time saves leader, Michael Mayer would be our saves leader. And as far as like bailing our asses out, he would. You know what? He should be the fact checker. He should be the official historian of this podcast because for how many times? Like you know how it was it? Is it PTI where they have the guy at the end of the show who's like Tony yeah. uh, Reality? Yeah, You're right. Yeah, yeah, Tony Reality. He's the Tony Reality. I don't know if he still does that or not. I haven't watched PTI forever. Oh, I don't know. I don't either. But it will be nice that here we are doing two shows a week. If we, if the course schedule allows that. And I'm in traveling for work. I'm in Toronto in June and I'm going to do a podcast because, um, no, it's not too far. Mike's like, that may be going too far, but thanks. No, no, (laughs) dude, you're, you're good. You're good people. Anyway, that, I'm doing a remote podcast somewhere because you know people want to talk about the Tigers. That would be awesome. And you know, or I'm in the press box after the game, and people are not looking at me because I'm talking with the microphone on top of a trash can, looking at me like I'm an idiot, going, and the Tigers, uh, you know, uh, lose seven to one. You know, it's like that's not 
Yeah. So, but yeah, that it, it, as I said, that's just meaningful baseball. That's all I can ask for. All right. Well, what for do we me, think tomorrow? Tomorrow, to me, is so big because uh, more than a normal opening day for me, because expectations have been so low for so long, right? Uh, I most years, any given game, I want them to win every time. But if they lose, eh, whatever. Okay, you move on. But let's face it, if they want to contend this year, if the plan is to win this division, you have to take two out of three on opening weekend from the Chicago White Sox because they are the dregs of, of, the, of the league by all estimation by most people. So all of a sudden there's, you know, the win in April counts as much as the win in September. So they can't drag their feet in April this year like they have the last few years. They got to win some ball games, and it might as well start tomorrow. I was uh, I was going to ask what you guys think the first nine is, like what you think the record is after the first nine is three against the White Sox, three against the Mets, three against Oakland. Mm-hmm. I know typically we do last ten, but last last nine, first nine, what you think the record is? I mean, they should come out of six and three, but uh, it's baseball, so I'm going to say five and four. I was going to say five and four would be very acceptable, but I want to six and three would raise an eyebrow and make me pretty happy. Yeah, I'm hoping six and three too. You know what? I'm gonna. You know what? I'm gonna be the. You know what? I'm gonna be the high man on this. They go seven and two. Seven nice. and two. Seven and two. I never looks at seven and two. Roll it. Put in. Got, put in the books. Seven, I've got two, seven two. Two quick questions about tomorrow because I've seen some discussion about this. It, they are facing Garrett Crochet, a hard throwing lefty. Uh, who do you think is going to bat lead off, and how many lefties are in the lineup? Hmm. Veerling bats lead off because Parker Meadows is going to replace him in like the fifth or sixth inning, and I think they start Keith and Carpenter and Green. I would think Ver- Veerling leads off, Meadows starts in center and hits eighth or something. Mm-hmm. Lefties are in the lineup, though. I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, they, they they have four options now, at least four. Uh, I don't think we're we're going to see McKinstry in the starting lineup, but yeah. Keith and Meadows. Yeah, I don't go Keith and Meadows. Well, then, you know, but there is also Green and Carpenter, right? So there, there's four. Oh well, yeah. Oh. Wait. <laughs> well, Green. I guess I wasn't even thinking Carpenter Green. You're right. Obviously, so three, but. Does Carpenter have to start? I don't know if he has to start. No, I, I actually, I, I keep thinking that Carpenter is not going to start. I, I feel mm-hmm. like, I actually, I, I get this sense that Canna might hit lead off tomorrow just because he's that that veteran. I mean, Veerling's a vet now too, but uh, yeah. just, um, I mean, he's going to be the on-base guy. But yeah, I'm going back and forth between, I mean, Green's going to play. We know Green's going to play. He's going to be in the lineup no matter what. Uh I don't think Hinch is going to sit Colt Keith in his first, I don't think so either. Uh, first game, so I feel like he's going to hit. And and he and Meadows have had, uh, in the last year or two in the minors, have hadn't, haven't had any real platoon splits uh, that I recall. But Carpenter has in the big leagues. So I'm thinking that Carpenter may ride the bench for the first three, four innings. And Hinch loves bringing power guys off the bench, right? Um, so bring that righty in. The first thing you do is you slide Veerling down to third to replace – or Shella, or whoever's playing there, Abanez, and then uh, Carpenter hits, uh, you know, hits a three-run bomb for you. But I don't know it's something I, I'd be interested to think about. And by the time people listen to this, it might already have been decided. So who cares? <laughs> then, all right, we'll leave with the podcast with this: Who hits the first home run of the year, and when? Uh, Baez. And yes, Javi Baez. Him. I was going to pick Baez too. He, <laughs> That's he, in he, Chicago too. Yes. Oh, uh, Torkelson's going deep. There you, go. you, you know what? I'm gonna go with Andy Baez. We'll do it just to just because he's been I like that. Yeah, I think he is a first home run of the year. So, all right. All that being said, we are out of here. We will be in Toledo on Friday for the home opener. Probably there a little early, Chris. I don't know about you, man, but I don't want to get down there at two because if we get down there at two, it's gonna be bad. Game is four, right? Be, yeah. I, I, yeah. I know. I think we either get there really early or we get there like. Right when the game starts. No, it's probably around. a good idea to get there early. Yeah. So we'll be out there Friday for the Tiger Miley Report home opener. Well, sort of home opener. But then Monday we'll be doing our first show uh, for that. And then we'll end up, like I said, there will be 
And our next show will probably be. I don't know, we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, you guys, you know, but uh, this is anyway, right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it. Please subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, what the hell are you doing? Please do so. Um, um, Motor City Metrics and the Tiger Miley Report. Subscribe to them both. We don't bother you too much. We promise. And if you want to donate, please, there's a donation link. It's been scrolling on the bottom. All the proceeds go back to the website and up cost equipment. Um, I'm buying the shirts for the gentlemen this weekend. So they're getting polos like this. And the Tiger Miley guys as well. And I will put a show. I will put. Yes, Joe. Absolutely. I'll put a do, donate link in the show description on YouTube. Or if I did not already. No, I did not. Um, but uh, yeah, there is a. I'll put that on the show description on the podcast side of things. So definitely, Joe, we will do that for you. So anyway, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. And uh, happy baseball opening day, everybody. Enjoy. We made it. Yes, we made it. We made it. No more college basketball, whatever you do in your free time. NFL draft. Yeah. Oh, the Lions, especially in Detroit.